On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Gorg looks at worry about our children. But a lot of us, we worry about our children and grandchildren. And I think what the Lord wants us to do is He wants us to find our delight in Him. When we delight in the Lord, when we, when we pursue Him, something will change in us and that will affect our children. So it's a beautiful story we heard from Luke chapter 7 of the, this widow, this, this widow uh, whose son dies and Jesus comes and he, he raises him. He, he raises him from the dead. And uh, it's interesting who's present for this wonderful miracle. It says that Jesus was with a crowd I guess Jesus was speaking so powerfully and working such wonderful miracles that there was a crowd following him. Wherever he went, there was a crowd around him. So there's a crowd, and the Scripture also says, and the disciples. So you got the 12 disciples, you got the crowd, you got Jesus, and they're going to this city called Nain. So Luke gives us the specific city, not just some random city, Nain, city of Nain. And as... Jesus and his crowd is going to the city, entering the gate, which is typically one of the common gathering places, the public place of the city. There's another crowd, and this is the funeral crowd. And we, we know what happens. Jesus, Jesus uh, feels compassion, pity for this widow and her only son who died. And, and it's, it says he, he touched, the translation we heard was he touched the coffin. Now, in Jesus' times, they didn't have any coffins. They didn't use coffins. They used what's called buyers. And those are basically a stretcher, a special stretcher for funerals. And what's happening is the more I study Scripture, the more I'm becoming a Scripture snob, you know? It's like it wasn't a coffin. They didn't have coffins, you know? And, I, you know, the reason they translate it like that is because most people don't know what a buyer is. I didn't know what a buyer was. But that's why they translate. So when someone's reading and they say, you know, and he touched the buyer, people say, what's a buyer? Well, it's basically like a coffin. And so here they write coffin. You know, the only problem with that is if you're imagining what happened, you're imagining maybe Jesus knocking on a coffin. That didn't happen. The person was there on the stretcher, the special decorated stretcher, and he told the young man, arise, you know. But anyways, um, do you believe that that happened? You do. So do I. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that, why that happened, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, this event did not happen far off in some desolate place in private. There wasn't just one witness or two witnesses or three witnesses. There was a whole crowd that was with Jesus. They saw it happen. The 12 disciples, they saw it happen. The people of Nain, the crowd there, they saw it happen. The mother, she saw it happen. And the man who was dead, he experienced it. And so, you know, someone can say, well, that never happened. Well, the second thing is, is Luke and his gospel was not written like 300 years later. Luke's gospel was written while many of the disciples were still alive. Many of the people from Nain they were still alive. They were still talking about it. They still, I'm sure, talk about it today in that region, just like they talk about Elijah when he uh, raised the boy from the dead. You don't forget those things. So did it really happen? Of course it really happened. And on top of that, this is in Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel in particular, Luke was a doctor. The Bible says Luke was a physician. So he was a man of science. He was concerned with, with accuracy. And we read in Luke's gospel, he starts his gospel, listen to this, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I too have decided, after investigating everything accurately anew, to write it down in an orderly sequence. For you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. So this is Luke in around the year 80. He's, he's, he's with Paul, and they're experiencing 
the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the miracles, the church spreading, and the disciples, many of them still alive, are preaching the gospel and, and telling the stories of Jesus, and many of them are writing it down. Mark has already, already wrote and written his gospel, and there's other writings, and Luke is realizing, okay, the disciples, they're getting older, we gotta, we gotta get this in writing, and we gotta get the story straight. And so again, as a man of science, he does this in an organized way, in a detailed way. He gets the story straight. He names the names of the cities. And if you don't believe him, when he, and again, Luke's writings were read widely. So if you don't believe what he's saying, just go ask the people of Nain. Most of them, many of them, they're still alive. And, and, and Luke's gospel has been handed down to us. Luke's gospel was recognized as an authentic accurate gospel. Luke got the story straight. And so again, historically, this is rock solid. Any honest historian would say, yeah, this is good history. The people of Jesus' time were a literary people. They knew how to get the story straight and hand it down. This wasn't new to them. And so do I believe this? Yes, I believe this. And, and this is, for me personally, this is this is real helpful because it helps for me to understand something that I've been dealing with in the last couple of years. Okay, I want to share with you something I've been dealing with in the last couple of years. I call it an intensification of joy. I don't know if any of you struggle with this, an intensification of joy. Now, when I encountered the Lord years ago as a teenager, I was filled with the joy of the Lord because I was filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with joy. The two always go together. And it doesn't just mean kind of a shallow, you know, ooh, I'm happy type thing, emotional thing. A deep, abiding joy, even in the times of trials and difficulties. Um, but what's been remarkable for me, what's, what has surprised me, is, is that this joy has been intensifying. And again, not just for the last couple of weeks, for the last couple of years. And I hesitate to talk about this because I think, well, maybe it's just a passing thing. But it doesn't seem to be a passing thing. As a matter of fact, it seems like the Lord is telling me this is only meant to increase and increase and increase. And I can, you know, as, as I was pondering this this morning, I was thinking um, two things in particular that I think have been contributing to this intensification of joy. And I can look back specifically uh, before being here at the center, I ministered to university students in Toronto, and I look at, back at that time too, and that joy was strong. The whole time in Toronto, this is just joy. This, 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 this uh, prevailing joy, this... this, this, this um, uh, sustained, the sustained joy. And again, for me, what, what's, what, what really kind of is remarkable is I experience this joy at odd times. Like when I wake up in the morning, early in the morning. Usually we're not joyful when we wake up in the morning. When I wake up in the morning, I find myself praising and thanking the Lord. That's weird. Or when I'm driving to work, when I'm driving to work in the morning. Usually when we're driving to work, you know, it's not. There's this joy, you know. So that's the first thing, the, 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 uh, the specific times. But again, the two contributing things is number one, for the last couple of years, I've shared this before, I know most of you are sick of hearing this, but anyways, for the last couple of years, I've been making one small change in my life every month. And I've been asking the Holy Spirit himself, Holy Spirit, show me what one small change you're giving me the grace to make this month that'll have the biggest positive effect in my life. And I've been doing that for years, and there's something about making small Holy Spirit changes that's transforming, and when we change, we're growing, and when we're growing, we're filled with joy. So that's, that's the one thing that, I mean, last month I made a change, man, it was awesome. It was an awesome change. This month I'm doing something else, it's awesome, okay? So that's the first thing, the, the, those small changes, my life is changing, and that's giving me hope and joy. But the second thing is I've been disciplining myself, again, specifically since my time in Toronto, but before that too, I like to thank the Lord all the time. Scripture says, give thanks in all circumstances. And so I try to do that, like I try to talk to God like all the time, like just, just talk to Him, talk and talk and talk. And I remember once I, was saying to, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, 
I must be getting annoying because I'm just talking to you all the time. You know what I felt the Lord saying to me? I love you so much, it's impossible for you to be annoying to me. You talk all you want. <clears throat> so I try to stay in the presence of the Lord all the time. And in particular, through thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Just thanking Him for my day, thanking Him for this, thanking Him for just, just thank you, thank you, thank you, just throughout the day. You know, not in a kind of anxious, kind of, you know, fleshly way, but just, just as, the, as, as the Spirit leads me, and, and I'm deliberate about it, but thanking the Lord all the time. And again, this, this seems to be a big part of the contribution um, to the joy he, He's been giving me. And again, we shouldn't be surprised because, you see, the Lord Jesus who comes across this fuel, funeral procession, his only desire is to give life. And the same Lord Jesus that rose this young man from the dead, raised him, told him to rise, and he was resuscitated, came back to life, that same Lord Jesus is with us always. He's walking with us, abiding with us, living within us. And there's only one thing he wants to do. He wants to give us life. He wants to be pouring out his life more and more and more in our life. And the more life he gives us, the more joy we're going to have. Scripture promises that. It's not an exception for some people. It's not, a, it's not kind of the exception. It should be the norm for Christians. Jesus promises. He promises us joy. He says, I'm going to give you not just any joy. I'm going to give you my joy. My joy is going to be in you. Your joy is going to be complete, and no one's going to be able to take it away, say us the Lord. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. So he promises us his joy. He promises us peace. He promises us a peace that surpasses our understanding. He promises us freedom, the freedom of the children of God. He promises us life, life in abundance. But also, you know, again, there's the story of Jesus raising the young man from the dead. Jesus had compassion on the widow. And there's when we walk with Jesus, even when we go through those hard times, those difficult times, those times of sorrow, those times of no mourning, those times of lamenting, which do not contradict the, the, the spiritual life, walking with the Lord. Even when we go through those times, we feel His compassion, and that brings us peace and consolation, and even joy. And we know people who go through very difficult situations, and yet they have that joy, and they testify to it. They say, this is one of the most difficult things I've ever been to, but there's been this joy. I felt his presence more than I've ever felt it before because the Lord is close to the broken heart, Scripture says. And so again, there's this presence. And of, of course, the Lord, he promises us troubles too. In um, John chapter 16, verse 33, the Lord Jesus said, I have told you this, that you may have peace in me, in the world you will have trouble, but take courage, I have conquered the world, or I have overcome the world. And so, yeah, the, the, the joy the Lord gives us does not mean we're not going to have our troubles. We all have troubles. I know that you have your troubles, your challenges, your, cro your crosses. You know that I have my troubles, challenges, and crosses, but they don't take away the joy. They don't take away the presence, because nothing can separate us from the love of God. So I just want to quote some scriptures to you this morning, um, or a few more scriptures to you this morning. First of all, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, um, this whole mystery of life and death, of being alive, of being dead. In, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus says, I know your works, that you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And the, Jesus is saying this to the church of Sardis. 
You know, I guess, I don't know what was up with that church. They were probably churchy people, but in their hearts they were dead. They weren't, they weren't filled with the love and the Spirit of God. Their lives didn't bear the fruits of living the gospel. And Jesus is saying, man, you guys think you live, but you're dead. And that's a reminder to us that even though we might be physically alive, we might find ourselves spiritually dead. And another, another passage that speaks to that is in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, verse 32, the story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son finally comes home, the father says, but now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life. Again, come to, come to life again, he was lost and has been found. So this mystery that we can be physically alive but spiritually dead. And we, we, need to, we need to be aware of that, of people going through this life without the breath of God within them, without the Holy Spirit within them. And the Lord, the Lord doesn't want us to be spiritual zombies. And, and again, as we as Catholics, we need to be careful about this because it's easy for us as Catholics to be good on the externals you know, to do the external Catholic thing, but inside there's not that life of God, that joy. And again, Jesus' warnings are strong about that. You know, uh, um, you know for example, our young people here who are, who are, to re- are about to receive First Communion, I'm sure I hope this will be a joyful day for you. But don't become a spiritual zombie. You know, let the joy you experience today become something that intensifies. That's what's supposed to happen. This intensification that the Lord wants to take you from glory to glory. And isn't it sad, isn't it sad when we do see our Catholic young people and they don't love God? They, they don't know the Lord. They live lives that reflect the fact that they're spiritual zombies. Zombies are into morbid things, you know, they're attracted to decay and all of that, and many of our Catholic young people are attracted to morbid things. Just listen to some of the music they listen to, some of the things they watch, and, and all of that kind of thing. I, mean, I don't want to get on a big rant about that, but it's sad. It's heartbreaking. It's tragic. People need to rise up and, 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 and prophesy and, and, and speak and, and work and, and, and do something, you know, for our young people because it's, it, it, we, we seem to be, you know, the culture seems to be intensifying its attack against our young people. And again, um, there's not many people doing much about it. Uh, now, I also want to speak of... The, the, again, this presence of the Lord. I want to give you, give you one more scripture, the presence of the Lord, and that's in John chapter 16, verse 7. You see, when Jesus was walking around Judea and all of that, he had the crowd with him and all of that, and then Jesus said, I have to go. And the disciples said, well, you have to go. That's an awful thing. But in John chapter 16, verse um, 7, Jesus says, but I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And you think, well, what's up with that? How can it be better that Jesus goes? The reason it's better that Jesus goes is because because Jesus is the incarnate word. And people could experience Jesus when they were close to him. But you know, if you're in a crowd and Jesus is kind of way over there, it's hard to get to him. But because Jesus has given us his spirit, We can have his presence, his grace, and his power with us all the time. We don't need to fight through a crowd. And and, and so again, as we we walk through life, he's with us always. I want to make one last point about this, this widow, this widow whose son was dead. Now, some of you mothers, maybe grandmothers, also dads, grandfathers, whoever else, Sometimes you feel like that about your own children. They might seem to you to be spiritually dead. And you might ask yourself, like, what do I do? Like, my grandchildren, they don't know the Lord. They're a bunch of zombies. They're walking around, but they're dead inside. They're into morbid things. They don't have the life of God in them, and it grieves me. You know, you talk to some grandparents and some parents, 
and it, 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 it's heartbreaking. There's nothing they want to see more than their children have the life of God in them. Partly because, and maybe largely because, they want to see them in heaven forever. And Jesus is pretty clear. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who don't believe will be condemned. Can't be any more clear than that. People who decide that they're not going to believe and are given all the grace and they still don't believe, it ain't looking good for them. And if that's your son, if that's your daughter, if that's your grandchild, that's not a good situation. And so I want to share with you a word that Father Bob, the founder of our Community Companions of the Cross, that he told parents and grandparents. He said to them, listen, there's a promise in Scripture, and it's in Psalm 37, verse 4. And it's verse, Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Find your delight in the Lord, and He will give you your heart's desires. Again, a lot of us, obviously, we need to pray and all that, but a lot of us, we worry about our children and grandchildren. And I think what the Lord wants us to do is He wants us to find our delight in Him. When we delight in the Lord, when we, when we pursue Him, something will change in us, and that will affect our children. First, it'll bug them. Then it'll start to intrigue them. And finally, it will inspire them, and it'll challenge them, and they will encounter the Lord. But if we don't become fire, if we don't become filled with the life of God, we won't bug them and, then, and eventually challenge them and inspire them and lead them to the Lord. I was looking up some beautiful quotes this morning from St. Catherine of Siena. She's known for her ca uh, classic quote. She says, Be who God meant you to be, and you will set the world on fire. Be who God meant you to be, and you will set the world on fire. Do you want to see your children alive? Do you want to see your grandchildren alive? Do you want to see your loved ones alive? Become fire. Become who you were meant to be, and you will set the world on fire. Your children, your grandchildren. I just want to end with one last quote from St. Catherine of Siena. She's got real cool quotes, by the way. Um, going back to this intensification of joy, again, uh, it's been embarrassing for me because I didn't think it was meant to be this way, all this joy, and it seems like it's here to stay. And then I read Teresa, St. Catherine of Siena. She says, all the way to heaven is heaven because Jesus said, I am the way. Let me, re let me read that to you once more. Another way she put it is, every step of the way to heaven is heaven because Jesus said, I am the way. And so if we are stepping towards heaven, it should be like heaven because we're on the way and Jesus is the way and we're with Jesus. It's about as close to heaven as you can get. And so brothers and sisters, don't grow weary in your journey to holiness and to the Lord and to the fire of the Holy Spirit. You desperately need to become holy, to become fire, not only for your sake, but for the sake of those around you. As Catherine of Siena says, become fire, become who you're meant to be, to who you're meant to be, and you will set the world on fire. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Mark Goring on Worry About Our Children, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD a program 1907. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at patient with ourselves and others. When we see our brokenness, our woundedness, in the light of the Lord's mercy and compassion, first of all, hopefully we learn to be a lot more patient with ourselves, but we also learn to be a lot more patient with others.
When I think of you, our Food for Life supporters, I'm often so deeply touched and so grateful for you. In fact, often when I think of you, and I often do, as well as pray for you, a scripture comes to mind, Philippians 1.3. I thank my God every time I remember you. And indeed I do. I have the privilege of opening the mail at the Food for Life office each week. I'm very touched by many of the letters that we get, many of the notes that you send. I'm often moved to stop right where I am and just pray for individuals who write in. You are such a blessing to Food for Life. Your generosity is so deeply appreciated. Many of you have stood with us for many years going back to the time of Father Bob McDougall and Father Bob Bedard, and you're still with us today. And likewise, some of you are newer and you've been watching the ministry more recently. But regardless, we are grateful for you and I truly do give thanks to you and we all do at Food for Life. You have made Food for Life possible. You have helped us really get the message out that we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We could not do it without you. It's by the grace of God and by your generosity. We hope that you will continue to stand with Food for Life if Food for Life has been a blessing to you, we would invite you to write in and to support us in some way. If you have watched the program but have never written in, I would especially ask that you would prayerfully consider writing in and standing with us with a one-time gift or if you're able to support on a monthly basis to help keep us uh, paying those expenses for airtime and everything else that is associated with the television ministry, we would be delighted to hear from you. We invite you to write in. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1907 and today's topic, Father Mark Goring on Worry About Our Children. Food for Life is a non-profit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post data checks or through our website, to help us continue the Food for Life ministry. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. And our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. Thanks to your faithful prayers and tax-deductible financial support, Food for Life is the longest-running Catholic television program in Canada. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at patient with ourselves and others. When we see our brokenness, our woundedness, in the light of the Lord's mercy and compassion, first of all, hopefully we learn to be a lot more patient with ourselves, but we also learn to be a lot more patient with others. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.